crews are on their starting boats. They do a coin toss before the race to choose which bank they start on. Oxford called heads, but it was tails. So Cambridge president uh, Kviva Dempsey chose the Surrey bank. And you can see the light blue of Cambridge on the right hand side of your screen, the dark blue of Oxford on the left. So this is it. The uh, Cambridge Cox, James Trotman, hand in the air to signify he is not quite ready, but we are ready now to hand to our commentary team to guide you through this one. Grace Prendergast, 2022 winner with Cambridge. Zoe de Toledo, 2012 Cox for Oxford. And our commentator, Andrew Cotter. Well, the crowds have come. The crowds have come out in their hundreds and their thousands, and they line up there on Putney Bridge. And the vagaries of the spring weather. Today, the wind comes down from the north northeast, and the temperature has dropped. There will be a bit of life in the river, and the challenge of the boat race is as much in dealing with that as with the opposition. And they wait on the stake boats. The hands up. One hand up, hand up from James Trotman, indicating that he is cocked for a Cambridge cruise. Not happy, but he is happy now. And they settle in, ready to go. His hands back up. My hands but then back the hand up. goes up, and so the hand of uh, Tara Slade goes up as well. A little smile there from Keep Esther on. Austin, the New Zealander at stroke in the Oxford boat, looking across. His nervous, nervous moments, and it all builds up to this in the next 20 My minutes or so. Attention, go! And Matt Smith umpiring his first boat race. Great oarsman himself. Says attention go and away they go. And they train and practice these starts over and over again. There are about 600 strokes in a boat race. But the first few are so, so important. The building blocks for everything that comes afterwards. And Oxford looked to good off to a bright start here. Again, the angle is deceptive. And we'll see who has got the early advantage. Looked like a really punchy start there from Oxford, actually. Not necessarily that clean, but very, very aggressive. They really went for it there on the blocks. They really did. And I think once you get those first few strokes out of the way, you can breathe a sigh of relief. It's a tricky way to start a boat race. Um, the Cambridge crew is taking a pretty aggressive turn back into the Oxford crew. But both, both crews have got out of the danger of those first few strokes. And so Grace, who was in the Cambridge boat last year, that so, so powerful boat, and the dark blue boat of Oxford last year was so strong as well. Very different feel to things this year, but this is a strong start as we look towards Bishop's Park and here at the boathouses, looking over the crowds towards them as they come past in a surge of spray and effort. And they go out so, so hard. You got out 40 strokes a minute and then settle down into a rhythm of perhaps 34 or so, but this is going to be such effort for the next 20 minutes and there's a good view there of Craven Cottage as they creep around there they'll be heading north into the wind and that's when the river really will come to life yeah we we might be in for some bumpy water so this next phase is going to be really important that both crews get on a good rhythm that regardless of what conditions are going to be thrown at them later in the race they they have a rhythm that can withstand it and and push through it and you've got to be really confident as well in this rough water to find a good strong rhythm as well you you can't keep spinning up with lots of strokes per minute you've got to find something that's going to take you over the middle of the course very impressed with this start by oxford again a long long way to go and it doesn't mean everything but the dark blues have got out to a very strong start cambridge are favored to win this and they're pretty strong favorites as well but at the moment oxford in a decent position but you can see the waters just starting to creep almost up and splashing those in the bow seats and again as they come around this new stand this very impressive new stand of craven cottage and they turn more towards the north they'll be into that headwind it'll be against the tide which is going with the cruise at the moment and that coming together of wind and tide will create a bit of chop we can see here, if you look at the very end of the boat, the, the forward part of the boat, quite often when crews think it's going to be rough, they put a little deck on to actually push some of the spray out. Doesn't look certainly like Cambridge have done that, so maybe they're thinking that this rougher weather won't last as long as, as we thought. Yeah, it's all about sort of 
assessing what you think the conditions are going to be and really play to those. And you can see it's pretty bouncy, but not 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 too bad at the moment. But it's it's going to be when they start to turn this bend, where, then you'll get to see it. Let's just listen in for a moment to the coxes. You can hear James Trotman, the Cambridge cox, and just listen go. to the instructions and the sound of the boats. show you that uh, the heart rate of the cops has even got to the 140s from a resting of 59. That shows that they are feeling attention as well. For the first time in the race, the blades are getting closer to the two crews. Yeah, they'll be feeling that as well. And I think the Cambridge crew is starting to, to edge back up. And once you get that bit of momentum, it, it gives you this, this second burst of energy. And I think there's nothing more motivating if the crew jumps out on you than being able to walk back up. And the, the, they'll know that Oxford has the inside bend at the moment. But soon, very soon, it's going to be coming back to, to Cambridge favouring their own bend. And it was interesting listening to James Trotman, the cops of the Cambridge crew there, because he he did sound very calm. He didn't sound worried about being a little bit down. And Oxford have now used up that little bit of advantage they had at the start. And like you say, Grace, now it's Cambridge's turn. Well, that first bend is worth about a quarter of a length to the crew on the Middlesex station, which is Oxford in this, and they have no advantage now as Cambridge start to move through. And when, I suppose, Grace, you're in a boat like that and you can feel yourself moving past your opposite number, that really does give you such a boost. It really does, and they'll all be able to see it out of the corner of their eyes, so it doesn't even need to be communicated, but then they'll know that they're slowly moving up seat by seat by seat, and it just, it's there's literally actually just not a better feeling, and, and I think when they also know they're about to get an advantage, they will be a hard crew to stop now, and this is probably a really important place for Oxford to stop that. Heading past a familiar sights of the boat race on the left, the Barnes Wetlands, and still heading all straight north here. The river really does loop around. It's no straight east to west race, but you can see the advantage that Cambridge have pulled out in the last two minutes. They have put on a, a big push, and the crowds again gathering in their hundreds and thousands on the banks watching on as the women have raced here on the championship course since 2015 and putting on a show. But I think what's interesting, if you look at the crews, we see Oxford now on the screen. They look quite relaxed. Their shoulders look like they've dropped down. They look like they're, you know, they're pushing their legs well. They don't look like they're having to work really hard here, whereas Cambridge have really put in a lot to get up into this position. First instructions from Matt Smith, who was chatting to him before, and he said, I want to be saying nothing at all in the race. I want it to be quiet and but as I said, we as commentators and viewers want something very different. But the first warning to both crews to pull apart there, I thought Cambridge really did seem to be creeping across. Well, Matt Smith, no stranger to an exciting race, but that's from the athlete's perspective. He was in the crew in 2001 where there was a restart and not forgetting 20 years ago, that incredible one-foot win. Cambridge warned there to get back towards the, the left, back towards the Surrey station. They just crept across a little bit. Once you get clear water, there's James Trotman. You can see his hands, just delicate hold on the rudder wires that steer the boat. And listen in. Now, if Cambridge were able to get clear water, they could choose whichever station they wanted. They could control the river. But then if Oxford were to re-establish contact, you could always get a disqualification. So Cambridge are being warned again, and this is bold cock saying from James Trotman. Oxford haven't lost touch. Look, what is that, a few feet of clear water? It is bold coxing, considering how close the crews are together, and I think the, the Cambridge rowers are going to really have to back up their coxing at the moment and make sure they keep moving. And, and Oxford are moving now. Actually, you heard you heard Torres Slade in the Oxford boat. She called a massive push there, and they are going for it. They know this is a do-or-die moment, Oxford, and Cambridge have got to move, or they are in trouble, serious trouble. Well, if Oxford can bump Cambridge, you know, you could have disqualifications in a scenario like that. So Cambridge have to move back to the Middlesex station, and they are moving now. But that touch of the rudder, that's break on a boat as well. So that's a big push by Oxford, but how much will it cost them? And, and you can see the panic start to kind of creep in on the face of Quiver and stroke seat on the Cambridge crew. You can, I think she was very aware of how close Oxford was, and 
they put in a good move to be like, if you're going to cut in front of us, we will make you pay for it. And that's exactly what you've got to do in a one on one race when you are a length down. You can't let the boat, you can't lose contact. You've got to stay with it. I thought for a second we might be having an Oxford Cambridge Buffs race on our hands. I think I've been saying that Cambridge have to move to Oxford Middle Tanks. It is, of course, Surrey on the south side. And now this big Surrey bend is a huge loop of the river. Now this is worth three quarters of a lane to the boat in the Surrey station, so to Middlesex, and uh, so to Cambridge. And look at the gap they've suddenly pulled out. So we talked about that effort that Oxford had made to re-establish contact, but again, that is energy spent. It was a, it, it's a lot of energy so spent, and not only sure in the no physical, but it's mental. They, they knew they had to do something then and there, and they responded, but it does look now like they're now paying for it. There's a, a familiar heads if you're sitting there. Dave Catherine Grange and Kyra as well and Casa watching on as they come past with so many of the, the crowds here that gather on that north bank there with all the pubs of Hammersmith. But again, in the last minute, Cambridge have really taken control of this race. Yeah, I mean, after that move from Oxford, I think you're right. They have to put a lot into that. But it was the right thing to do because ultimately, if they could have even touched the Cambridge boat, that could have been game over for Cambridge. And it looked like they were centimetres away from doing that and a little bit of luck on, on maybe Cambridge's side that they didn't didn't get hit, but um, they seem to be now capitalising and, and they've recognised that now's the time to keep moving. And there, look at that picture. That's an example of what the wind can do to a river because now as they start to come around and they're more sheltered, or they, they'll start to get it almost as a tailwind, it calms things down. So it's going to be... Planar sailing quite often when you come into Chiswick Reach here and towards the Chiswick Gate. This is when the waters chop up because you'll be heading southwesterly. Just let's listen to Tara Slade here. Just because I, the dynamic of a cox that knows they're a long way behind, what do you say to your crew? You've got to be realistic, but you've got to stay positive at the same time. And it's ultimately, it's probably the hardest thing that you've got to do in that position. Because you can't just say, this is game over. And you can hear what she said. She's saying, they went too hard. We, we, we're still in with a chance. And that's exactly, that's exactly what I would do. I think that's the, that's the only thing you can do, really. It is, and that's the, that's the toughest thing about this race, is once you're behind, you cannot see anyone. And you need to listen to your cops and trust that they, they know what's happening in front of you and it's a do or die moment and you just have to go with that. Over halfway now and there's a new halfway post in there in the grounds of St Paul's School and they'll come past it now and out to it. Well an enormous lead now for Cambridge and as the waters calm down they hope very much that it is going to be a plain sailing from now on as Cambridge look to extend this dominance so Oxford just have to dig in and this is where again we've talked about it before the cox almost has to lie to the crew and say yes they're not going anywhere they're not getting away from me even if that isn't quite the truth it's such a fine balance isn't it because you need to keep the trust of your crew but equally they're going to be aware it's really subtle things you know if you're in a boat that's behind you can't see them but you can see the disturbance of the water from their blades slowly starting to edge away so you do know that something is changing and, and again you can feel it when you come back to them it feels a bit bumpier that's you know that's how you know that you're moving back towards a crew so look at matt smith now he's put his flags away he's just enjoying being at the head of this flotilla <laughs> enjoying the the trip down the thames as we look down and the giant insects that creep up the water there it's a beautiful sight and a familiar sight but that is a big big gap between Cambridge and Oxford and they are surely heading to victory still a long long way to go and still much can happen but this Cambridge crew is uh, an impressive one not quite of the caliber of last year that was a different feel to that boat as it was for the, uh, the Oxford boat as well but my goodness, they've come together well here. And again, Oxford just have to persevere and say, we've trained so hard for this, we're not going to go gently. Yeah, and Cambridge has the luxury now that they can sit out in front. All, all eight rowers can see the Oxford crew behind them and you can start relaxing and, and everything sort of seems to come a little bit easier, which is a very privileged position. I mean, you say easier, but we can see Quiver Dempsey's heart rate there is 178, which is two to three times what those sitting at home watching is going 
going to be right now. So she's still working very hard to put her crew out there in front. But yeah, she'll be she'll be working very hard. And I think you don't realize in a race like this, the rowers are in an immense amount of pain from probably from about 60 to 90 seconds in, and they have to be comfortable being that uncomfortable for almost 20 minutes. It's it's. It's tough, it's tough, and that's part of long distance racing is figuring out who can be uncomfortable the longest. And, you know, you can compare it to championship racing, which is over two kilometre courses, and, and here, you know, in kilometre terms, 6.8 kilometres, it's a very different feel. It is a very different feel, and, and you saw it in the start of this race, you have to go harder than you want to go at the start because you don't want to get behind, so the nature of that means you're going to be in pain very early on. It's interesting. James Trotman just looking yeah, nice. round, seeing where are we in the in the river. We're in a very good position. And again, Tara Slade saying, you're going to have them. And again, that's the, the kidology that you have to adopt at times, because I don't think the lead has stretched out too much further, but it's it's simply unbridgeable as they come to the crossing. There still is a long way to go, and looking at the stroke there, Esther Austin, the New Zealander, the most uh, experienced, the only one over 30 in the boat. Yeah, but as the, the horn sounds, you see the wash of the river behind from the flotilla battering off the walls, and the crowd have come to watch this, and the race to come as well. So it is staying at about that same distance, and Oxford are doing all they have to do in, in sort of trying to keep pace, but it's impossible to see a way back from here. It's tough. I think they'll just be wanting to keep the pressure on and hopefully... The, make the Cambridge crew feel uncomfortable enough that maybe a little mistake will, will slip in and, and maybe they've gone too hard and the fatigue will make something happen and this is what they've trained for all season so they're not going to give up lightly. Let me take you through the Cambridge boats, Karina Graf in the bow scene, then Rosa Millard, Alex Riddle, Webster there and Jenna Armstrong, the American just going out of shot, another American, Freya Quito and then another and Isabel Bastien, Creole, Brilon, the Canadian, the internationalist just behind Kiva Dempsey, in the stroke seats, who is the only one with experience of the boat race, of being in a blue boat. And there is Barnes Bridge now creeping into view. So they know they're into not quite the final stages because all the way around the Are bend there you can see Chiswick like Bridge, which is where line. they will finish. Still some way to go, but they know they're into the final third of the race. I think this is really where that suffering aspect really comes into this. It's like you said, Grace, it's such a tough race physically. It's three times the length of an Olympic race. And that suffering is really brought to the forefront by this media attention, which ultimately, you know, you've, you've been to the Olympics. Even the most elite rowers in the world don't get the chance to perform in front of this kind of crowd. No, and on TV and, and along the banks, you are racing this race, and it is a long distance race, and you have people continually cheering for you and watching you along the bank. And, there is a lot of excitement, but a lot of pressure as well. But ultimately, this is the thing, right? If the cameras were all switched off and nobody turned up on the bank, these 18 athletes would still be out here doing this exact same thing. Well, I always said of the men's race and now of the women's race, it's a private match for public consumption, and the public do come to consume it again. You can see, I was wondering with the weather today, if they were going to come out in numbers, and they have in thousands again. As James Trotman now just cruising along with, with Cambridge, his crew have put in a huge effort here as they come around to shoot the central span of Barnesbridge. One of the one of the rules of the boat race, Hammersmith and Barnesbridge, you shoot the central spans. And again, the gap, the lead remains the same, if not creeping out even further. So for Oxford, it is a lost cause in terms of winning the race, but again, still competing for their own pride and their time. Nice rhythm, says James Trotman, as it has been throughout from this light blue crew. And he says other things as well, so apologies if you heard that. He's been so good until this point, James. It's one, one way to motivate your crew, but he'll, he'll be relishing in this. So coming, coming around this last bend, and you, you don't know. You, you spend this whole season training, but you have not had the opportunity to race Oxford or Cambridge. But there you can see a big gap extending out. It is a big gap, but it's not it's not gone away as much as it, it might have. Oxford have dug in pretty well. I think this is actually a really impressive performance from this Oxford crew. 
they are much more of a sort of homegrown talent, I guess. You know, three three legs a row at Oxford, one at Cambridge. On paper, a weaker crew, I guess, but they've built this real family feeling and they just threw everything they had at Cambridge. You know, when you look down from on high and you see the boats moving in such a serene fashion and then you see the close-up of the faces and you see the effort and it is writ large on the faces of the Cambridge crew who are dominating this race, but you know you've been there grace you know how hard it is and i think it's really interesting it always feels closer as as a rally. they will be still so uncomfortable and you can see it on those faces there is so much hard work going in and they will be counting down the strokes to the line and the landmarks remain the same the brewery of mortlake in the distance and then they keep coming around the bend and then there's a straight of about three four hundred meters towards the finish just shy of chiswick bridge duke's meadow on the Right hand side, Barnes to the left, and the placid waters of the Thames now. And Cambridge continue, continue to race without letting up, as you can't let up in the in the boat race. And the Cox will ask for a final effort to take them to the finish line and to another victory. Yeah, they've done well, well to hold on to this streak and often that adds a lot of pressure and a, a lot of extra expectations, but the, the Cambridge crew have been able to really rise to the occasion today. So word for the Oxford crew as we take you down that boat. Laurel Kay, the American in the bow seat, and Ella Stadler in two, Sarah Helene, the president in three, then Freya Willis, the Australian, Alison Carrington, Claire Aiken for Aiken from uh, Oxtararder in Persia, Sarah Marshall, Esther Austin we saw in the stroke seat and, and Tara Slade the Cox. Again that gap hasn't shrunk, it hasn't grown. It has been Cambridge keeping Oxford at bay and Chiswick Bridge is drawing nearer. You can hear Tara slight slate there, the Oxford Cox, she's talking about pride. Six months, every early morning, every session. And that's the same, obviously, for all 18 athletes in this boat. But what Cambridge have done here, they're about to take a sixth win in a row. And I don't think that's something that you can look past. You really can't, but you do. You've got to think of these crews. Both crews have put in just as much work and time. That we're coming up to the line and, and, and someone has to win and someone has to lose. And that's the ruthless nature of sport. The final few pulls on the oar for Cambridge as they come towards victories once more six in a row now for the light blues and the recent story of the women's boat race tells of cambridge dominance and now they can ease down now they can relax and now they can smile and celebrate and you hear the roars and the cheers and you see the gap as oxford come through second place but second as they know is nowhere in the boat race it is cruel and unforgiving it is everything and nothing, and Cambridge have it all this year. They have it all again. Steady on, James. That was an impressive effort. An impressive effort from Cambridge. And again, you have to say an impressive effort from Oxford. Tara Slade's got her hand up. I'm not sure Well, the protest will go back to when James Trotman so. You see the hip hip raise here, you hear them, but Tara Slade has her hand up, she's going to object. I think it's, uh, well, Zoe, what do you think? I can see where she's coming from, but I think ultimately it didn't change the outcome of the race. They did, but there was no contact. That is the uh, responsibility of a cox. All coxies will, if there was something close like that, you will protest. But I think, as you heard Matt Smith, they say Goodbye, there was no girls. contact. Good fight, guys, says Esther Austin. There was no contact. So if there had been contact when James Trotman steered Cambridge across, then that would have been a very different matter. And this is one of the things about the boat race. There are very, very few rules, and a lot of it is left to, to the discretion of the umpire. But ultimately, Unless there's contact, you can't really argue a foul. And without that, if the race had been closer, then maybe you could have argued that that was very disruptive and etc. But Cambridge rode away with such, um, so, just so imperious really after that, that actually I think it would be hard to argue that that did change the outcome of the race. Six in a row now in the women's race. And it's interesting when you talk about the 
the, the women's crews and the lightweights and everything being integrated at Cambridge and they've come together as one club and they have their new boathouse which actually coincides almost with the start of their period of dominance so that all the crews are working there at Ely together. I'm sure that's not coincidence. There's a Cambridge juggernaut at the moment which ultimately there have been no Oxford wins so far this year. The lightweights, the veterans, the spares, and now obviously this race we've just watched. It's difficult to see past that at the moment, and obviously success begets success. It all builds on the year before. That's quite impressive from James Trotman. A, a, a rowing boat is not a stable thing. It's uh, That could easily have ended in Trotman down. A soggy end to your boat race win. Trotman overboard, but uh, the protest by Tara Slade in Oxford has been explained away and dismissed by Matt Smith, the umpire, and it is victory for Cambridge again. I think they're just... So James Trotman asking to see the white flag there. He wants... So there we are, victory again for Cambridge, six in a row in the women's boat race.